relating pressure, volume, amount, and temperature, the ideal gas law. There are generally four physical properties that describe a gas. The volume, the amount of the gas, the temperature of the gas, and the pressure of the gas. So historically, when scientists were um, measuring gases and doing experiments with involving gases, they were trying to determine the properties of gases and how they were different than those of liquids and solids. And one thing that some early scientists noted, Robert Boyle and Robert Hooke, was that when you increase the pressure on a gas, you decrease the volume of the gas. So um, here is some gas in this what's called a J tube. And so some gas would be um, added to the tube and then some mercury would be added to the tube and the mercury would as it's added it's heavy and it's being added to the tube and pushing on the gas over here and as you add more and more mercury into the tube you are pushing harder and harder on this gas and remember we said before when we're looking at the manometer one way to measure the pressure inside this system is to measure the height difference between the surface of the mercury. So here's the surface of the mercury down here and the surface of the mercury up here. So there's this much pressure on the gas when I have this much mercury in the tube. But if I add more mercury to the tube, then the height difference increases, which means that the pressure has increased on the gas. So here's a small pressure. Here's a big pressure. When I have a small pressure, the volume is large. But when I have a large pressure, the volume is small. So this is what um, these two scientists realized about gases, was that as we increase the pressure on a gas, we decrease the volume, and vice versa. So there's an inverse relationship between volume and pressure. So here's what we are what we now know is happening when we think about the particles so um, the particles when uh, they are uh, when there's a one kilogram weight on top of a piston here and there's one kilogram of pressure pushing down on these gas particles then the volume is one liter so these gas particles are pushing and the, a kilogram is pushing down and the gas particles are pushing up. So as the gas particles are pushing up, um, they're uh, providing a force that's balancing out this kilogram pushing back down. If I increase the force that's pushing down, this is one kilogram pushing down, and now there's two kilograms pushing down. As I increase the force pushing down so that now there's two atmospheres, for example, that's going to decrease the volume. So if I increase the pressure of the gas, then I've decreased the volume. Uh, and there's always this inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Increasing one decreases the other, um, and vice versa. Here's a graph that shows how the volume and pressure are related. So as I go this way, on the graph, I'm increasing the pressure. This, this axis down here is pressure in millimeters of mercury. So as I go this way on the graph, like this, I'm going up in pressure. But as I go this way on the graph, going down like this, I'm going down in volume. So this axis here is volume. So if we follow this line, as I go like this, I'm going down in volume, volume's decreasing. And as I'm moving to the right, the pressure is increasing. So we can see that as we, if, if we're making, taking measurements on a system and I'm showing how the volume and the pressure are related, this is the kind of relationship that I would see, which is that as the pressure increases, as I keep increasing the pressure more and more and more this way, the volume keeps going down further and further and further. And as I say, as I squeeze this gas more and more and more and the volume keeps decreasing more and more, eventually I'll squeeze it so much that those gas particles will start to stick and they'll turn into a liquid. 
um, which is what happens when you compress a gas. If you take the gas particles and we push them together so close that they're so close together, and I keep bringing this piston even further down, as they get closer and closer together and they can't escape each other at some point, they condense and turn into a liquid if we increase the pressure enough. So the um, mathematical relationship that we've seen here that, uh, that's, that we call Boyle's Law is that the pressure and volume at one point are equal to the pressure and the volume at another point. So um, this relationship that we see here means that as if I have one value for pressure and volume and then I double the pressure for example, that's what we did in the last example. I went from one kilogram to two kilograms of, of pressure that's pushing down on that gas. Then if I double the pressure, then the volume gets cut in half. So this gets twice as big, but this gets half as big. And so they're actually multiplying that twice as big times half as big equals one, which is equal to where we started. So we, this would be um, the original values that we had. So this relationship, it, we call this Boyle's Law, P1V1 equals P2V2. We can see Boyle's Law in action when we uh, think about scuba divers. So when you go scuba diving and you are under the water and there's a lot of water on top of you, that water is pushing down on you in the same way that the atmosphere pushes down on you when you're on land. So if you're um, at sea level and there's a lot of atmosphere pushing down on you, then um, there's a, a higher pressure. But if you're up on a mountain or in an airplane and there's less air pushing down on you, then you're at a lower pressure. Well, the same is true of the water. If you're really low underwater, deep under the water, then there's a lot of water above you and it's very heavy and it's pushing on you and there's a, a high pressure pushing on you. But if you're right at the surface, there's not much water pushing down on you, so there's not as much pressure added from the water. So as the pressure from the, wa um, from the water is pushing down on you, there's gas inside of your body. There's gas inside of your lungs and there's gas inside of your air, or excuse me, there's gas inside of your blood. Um, there's oxygen inside of your blood as you breathe in oxygen and it oxygenates your blood and it travels um, in, through your hemoglobin and there's carbon dioxide that's dissolved in your blood and nitrogen that's dissolved in your blood. So lots of the gases that are found in air um, are inside your body even when you're scuba diving because you're breathing air when you're down there. So those gases become compressed in your body when you're scuba diving at really low depths. And if you uh, come to the surface very quickly then the pressure change is so great so quickly then the gases inside your body feel that pressure change also and um, they start to uh, come out of uh, they start to precipitate from your blood basically which means they start to bubble out of your blood so that's uh, that situation is called the bends and that's what happens when scuba divers come to the surface too quickly if they've been down at, at really low at really when they've been scuba diving at low depths that's why when you are scuba diving you're supposed to come to the surface very slowly um, when you've been down really deep so that the gases in your blood don't have a very don't experience a very big pressure change very quickly So another relationship is called Charles' Law, and this relationship shows us how um, the volume of a gas is related to temperature. And we can see that in a hot air balloon. So as we um, heat the air inside of the balloon with the fire, then that air expands and the volume increases. 
and um, as the volume increases it blows up the balloon and the reason that it floats is because the hot air weighs less than cold air and so buoyancy pushes the, the, the air pushes the hot air balloon up because that hot air is less dense than the cold air underneath it and we can see that here with this balloon too if you if you blow up a balloon so that it's full and then you put it in liquid nitrogen that full balloon squeezes down and kind of deflates and looks like it doesn't have any air in it but then if you take it out of the liquid nitrogen and set it on the table after several minutes it will blow up again and look like it's full of air just like it did before so the volume of the gas changes when the temperature changes it gets it increases when i add heat the volume gets bigger and the volume decreases when i take heat away when i put it in something really cold so the reason for that is because the size of the balloon the volume of the balloon is a function of the pressure and as these particles are hitting the walls of the balloon and they are imparting a force the balloon has a force too because it's kind of elastic right and that elastic balloon is pushing inward and there's also air outside of the balloon atmospheric pressure that's pushing inward so this the the balloon getting bigger means that these particles on the inside must be pushing harder so as they push harder the balloon can get bigger so a particle can push harder when it's going faster and particles that are hot move faster that's really what temperature is is as particles get hotter and hotter and hotter they move faster and faster and faster and particles in ice are not moving very fast at all they're kind of stuck but particles in hot water are moving very quickly and particles in steam are moving even faster so if these particles are moving quickly and they're imparting a large force to the balloon that blows the balloon up but if I cool them down and I put the balloon in ice water now then those particles start moving slower and slower and slower and as they move slower they hit the wall with less force the walls of the balloon and as they hit the walls of the balloon with less force then the balloon starts to cave in because the remember the balloon is elastic which is kind of pulling it back down to where it started and there's air on the outside that's kind of pushing it in the atmospheric pressure that's that is pushing from the outside of the balloon so this is kind of a molecular view of why um, what we call Charles law which is the relationship between the volume of a gas and the temperature of a gas so here is another graph where we put uh, volume on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis and so um, if we're measuring the temperature of a gas and we're measuring how big the balloon is so I blow up a balloon with some gas 25 liters of a gas and um, it's at 400 degrees C I have a gas that's at 400 degrees C 25 liters as I cool the gas down to 300 the volume of that balloon is decreased if I put the balloon in ice water it gets smaller so as it gets colder 200 degrees C it gets the volume decreases more at 100 degrees C it decreases more when it gets all the way down to zero when it gets down to ice water the temperature of ice water then the balloon has been cut even more than half 25 we started up here and now we're all the way down here so we see this relationship no matter where what volume we start with and what temperature we start with we see that if I start with a volume here and a temperature here and then I decrease it then the new volume is here and if I decrease the, the temperature by 100 degrees again it's here and by 100 degrees again it's here and it makes a straight line so all of these no matter how much what the volume or the temperature is where I start all of these relationships always have a straight line and um, what Charles noticed was that if you he could only measure the temperatures down to about zero degrees C 
because ice was really kind of hard to come by a long time ago before we had ice machines. You had to wait till it snowed. And if you lived in a place where it never snowed, then you, it was really hard to ever get ice. So it was hard to take measurements below zero degrees C. But he noticed that if he took the, all these measurements and then he traced the line down back down to zero volume and he took these measurements down to ice water the lowest he could and traced the line and took these measurements down to ice water and traced the line all of those lines ended up at the same place when they crossed um, this line right here uh, which is where the volume goes to zero right here is where the volume hits zero and so this point is what we call absolute zero and this is um, the point that Charles recognized that if you decrease the volume, the temperature, and the volume keeps getting lower and lower and lower, if you, dec if you keep decreasing the temperature, the volume is going to get lower and lower and lower. And if you keep decreasing the temperature even more, eventually you're going to hit a point where the volume goes to zero, where the vol it seems like that thing disappears. Well, that temperature always happened to be the same temperature, no matter which gas he started with when he drew these lines. So that temperature we now know is called absolute zero, and that is the coldest temperature in the universe. It's the coldest possible temperature. It's the point at which, according to this theory, a gas would get smaller and smaller and smaller until that gas would disappear. Well, we know that gases don't disappear at any point so right before the gas right before the volume goes to zero is the coldest point in the that's possible in the universe um, so absolute zero is negative 273.15 degrees celsius and we also call that zero kelvin so uh, the kelvin scale starts at absolute zero zero kelvin but the Celsius scale has a zero point way up here at the freezing point of water and we have to get much colder before we hit absolute zero on the Celsius scale. So Charles' law shows us the relationship between volume and temperature and as we increase the temperature of a gas we also increase the volume. Think of the hot air balloon as the temperature goes up, as the fire gets hotter, the volume gets bigger, the balloon blows up. And if I put that balloon in ice water and I cool it down, as the temperature gets colder, the volume goes down. So this is a, these are directly proportional to each other. Um, whereas pressure and volume were inversely proportional. When one went up, the other went down. Volume and temperature are directly proportional. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. So the way we represent that mathematically is V1 over T1, the volume of a system at some temperature, is equal to the volume of that system at some other temperature. So one thing I want to, rec um, want to mention about this Charles Law when we're using this equation, we always have to provide the temperatures in Kelvin. We can't put degrees Celsius into Charles Law equations because the numbers that we get won't work. OK, one more law is Avogadro's Law. And Avogadro recognized that the volume of a system increases when we add particles to it. So if you have a bike pump and or even you're blowing up a balloon, as you blow another breath, the balloon gets bigger. And you blow another breath and the balloon gets bigger. And you blow another breath and the balloon gets bigger. So the more air you add to the balloon, the larger the volume gets. So this was Avogadro's law, was he, he would measure precisely how much he was adding to each balloon, and he would see what the volume increase was. And so um, Boyle recognized that volume was proportional to the inverse of pressure, 
Charles recognized that volume was proportional to temperature, and Avogadro recognized that volume was proportional to the amount of gas. So when we stick all of these equations together, we uh, develop what we call the ideal gas law. And um, these four properties of a gas, pressure, volume, the amount of the gas, and the temperature of the gas, are really the only properties that we need to measure the state of that gas. And so P, V, N, and T are very important uh, variables when we're measuring gases. Um, R is a proportionality constant. So probably familiar with pi and what pi is, pi is the number 3.14, remember it has a lot of digits, it keeps going. What pi is, is it tells us the relationship between the diameter of a circle and the circumference of a circle. So as a circle gets bigger, its diameter gets bigger, and its circumference gets bigger also. Well, what's the relationship between its diameter and its circumference? The relationship is pi. So it's a proportionality constant. As one gets bigger, the other gets bigger times pi. Well, R is a proportionality constant for gases. As PV gets bigger, NT gets bigger. By how much? By R. So this, was, this proportionality constant in the gas law serves the same function as pi does when we're talking about circles. So. P is the pressure, and usually we measure that in atmospheres. L is the volume, or uh, V is the volume in liters. Uh, uh, liters. Um, N is the moles of gas. T is the temperature in Kelvin. R is the, I, we call it the ideal gas constant. That's that proportionality constant. So R has different units depending on um, where, what, the application is that we're trying to use it for, what problem we're trying to solve. So generally when we're using ideal gas problems, we use units that are liter atmospheres per mole K. And when we use these units of the ideal gas constant, it has this value. So if you ever see that R has a different number associated with it, that's because it has different units. So the units of R can change, and when they do, the number changes too. Even though it's always the same value, if I change the units, I change the number, like 1 foot and 12 inches. Those represent the same length, but they're different numbers because I changed the units. So sometimes that happens with R also. So um, when we're talking about the ideal gas law and we're talking about making measurements on gases, then it's important for us to define a standard temperature and pressure. So this is because when different researchers and different scientists are taking measurements on gases, they want to be able to replicate the same conditions because the volume of a gas is related to its temperature and its pressure. So if I'm measuring the volume of gases at different temperatures and different pressures than somebody else, then the volumes are going to be different. So um, to define a standard temperature and pressure is important so we can relate our measurements to each other. So the standard pressure is one atmosphere and the standard temperature is zero degrees C, which is also equal to 273 Kelvin. So um, whenever we refer to the standard temperature and pressure, sometimes we say STP. So <clears throat> we can calculate the volume of one mole of gas at STP. So um, one mole, the temperature is zero degrees C, and the pressure is one atmosphere if we're at STP. And so at STP, one mole of any gas occupies 22.4 liters. This was kind of Avogadro's discovery, um, was that the volume of the balloon, how big the balloon gets, is related to how many particles there are. Well, it turns out that it doesn't matter what kind of particles they are. The same number of particles 
will go into a balloon that's 22.4 liters, regardless of what kind of particle they are. There's always one mole of gas in all of these balloons. So we can plug these numbers into the ideal gas law to prove that the volume will be 22.4 liters. So if I have one mole, um, and we start with the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT. And if we're going to solve for volume, then I would divide both sides by P. And I get V equals nRT over P. So if I plug in one mole and the ideal gas constant from before, and zero degrees C and one atmosphere pressure for STP, then I plug all these numbers into the ideal gas law, then what I get is 22.4 liters. So we can see that if I have one mole of any gas at STP, the volume is always 22.4 liters.